Why don't we go ahead and get, uh, get started. Uh, I would remind people uh, if they would just take a moment to turn off, of their, turn off their cell phones. I'd appreciate that. There we go. Somebody's listening to me. Uh, I'm John Malcolm. I'm the director of the uh, Edwin Meese uh, Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Uh, we are here today to discuss a new book entitled uh, Obama's Enforcer, Eric Holder's Justice Department. The book is a thorough, provocative, and unsparing account of the Department of Justice under the tenure of Attorney uh, General Eric Holder. It describes a Justice Department that is suffused with hyperpartisanship and racialism. It describes a department that is preoccupied with imposing its version of racial justice and which has no qualms about bending, ignoring, or breaking laws to suit its purposes, no qualms about attempting to discredit conservatives who served in the prior administration or who still serve at the Department of Justice, and no qualms about covering up its own dirty laundry such as Operation Fast and Furious. We are fortunate to have with us today the uh, co-authors of this book, Hans von Spakovsky and John Fund, who previously collaborated on uh, Who's Counting, How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk, which was published by Encounter Books in 2012. To my immediate left is John Fund, an award-winning journalist who's been referred to as the Tom Paine of the modern congressional reform movement, John is currently the National Affairs Columnist for National Review Magazine and is a frequent analyst for Fox News Channel. He's the author of several books and a former columnist and member of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. To my far left is my friend and colleague Hans von Spakovsky. Hans is a senior legal, is a senior legal fellow here at the Mead Center, and he is a former presidential appointee to the Federal Election Commission. <coughs> Prior to joining the commission in 2006, Hahn served as a counsel to the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you all for coming. I'm John Fund. Before we begin, I thought I'd give you an update on the news, which touches on the Justice Department. Um, you probably have heard the story that last Friday the IRS notified Congress it had lost two years of Lois Lerner's emails. The dog ate my emails for two years. Well, the dog was very hungry because today the IRS quietly told Congress that it has lost the emails of six other key players in the IRS scandal, including those of Nicole Flax, who was the chief of staff to the former IRS commissioner, Stephen Miller, who was <laughs> fired in the wake of the targeting of conservative nonprofit scandal. So clearly this dog has now eaten up seven employees' emails, and I sure hope they send him to the pound soon because he is doing untold damage in trying to uh, conduct this investigation. The reason why this touches on the Justice Department, of course, is the Justice Department is in charge of the investigation of the IRS targeting scandal. It has been moving with glacial pace. I can't say they haven't interviewed anyone, but of all the players I know, they haven't gotten to them yet, and it's only been 13 months, so they must be moving with all deliberate speed. In addition, the head of the investigation is Barbara Bosterman, who is a career Justice Department trial attorney, but she's also one of the most important Obama campaign donors, um, almost $7,000 to President Obama's re-election and original election campaign, and an original supporter starting all the way back in the primary season of 2008 when Hillary Clinton was the clear front runner. Of course, there is no conflict of interest here, according to the Justice Department, not even, to quote President Obama, a smidgen of evidence that there is a conflict of interest. So I'm not here to directly address the IRS scandal, although that may come up in questions. What I would like to talk about uh, before Hans goes into more detail in our book is a little bit about the record of the Obama administration's um, rather remarkable expansion of executive power and authority. 
As you know, every president has the right and the responsibility to exercise his full constitutional powers, to implement his electoral mandate, and to resist encroachment on those powers by the legislature and judicial branches. However, this president has increasingly taken upon himself powers and authority that previous presidents never have, and there are some egregious examples. Back in 2011, President Obama rejected the notion that he, as he put it, quote, I can just suspend deportations of illegal immigrants through executive order, unquote. As he acknowledged back in 2011, there are laws in the books of Congress, and for me to simply, through executive order, ignore those congressional mandates would not conform with my appropriate role as president, unquote. That was then. This is now. Congress then refused to enact the DREAM Act, which affected uh, illegal aliens under the age of 18 who had come to this country uh, largely through no fault of their own. Congress's failure to act, the Obama administration then reasoned, justified adoption of the so-called deferred action policy, which does precisely what Congress refused to do when it declined to pass the DREAM Act. It exempted from deportation up to two million illegal aliens who were children when they came to the United States. Similarly, the administration has announced it will not enforce immigration laws with respect to illegal aliens who are parents or legal guardians of U.S. citizens. Secondly, the Obama Department of Education effectively amended core requirements of the No Child Left Behind Act by granting states wholesale waivers in return for their agreement to adopt certain education policies established by the department, rather than those established by Congress, which is the lawmaking branch. And lastly, when the Senate refused over an extended period of time to confirm <coughs> President Obama's nominees to the National Labor Relations Board, President Obama gave all of them temporary appointments under the Recess Appointments Clause, notwithstanding the Senate was meeting every third day in pro forma sessions and therefore was not in recess. President Obama has declared the Senate's pro forma sessions a practice which dated back over 60 years to be a nullity and thus presumed to overrule the Senate's judgment as to when it was in session and when it was in recess. The administration actually made the extraordinary argument before the Supreme Court, which is due to rule on this case in the next week or so, that the Senate could, of course, retain its recess power by just remaining in session continuously, forever. That would be the only remedy that they would have to avoid a recess appointment. This record, extreme positions on the scope of federal power, has generally left even sympathetic judges to a liberal president unimpressed and, frankly, in opposition. One of the more remarkable <coughs> distinctions of the Obama administration since 2012 has been the Supreme Court has ruled against the Justice Department's position on key issues approximately a dozen times, depending on how you characterize the decision, at least 10 probably 11, possibly 12. These come in a remarkable series of cases. They involve everything from religious freedom to property rights to Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, it goes down the line. I'll just give you a couple of interesting examples. And again, these are all unanimous defeats by the Department of Justice at the hands of the Supreme Court. Sackett versus the Environmental Protection Agency, the Justice Department tried to prevent a family from defending itself and contesting ludicrous order from federal bureaucrats. Uh, basically, the EPA directed this family that was trying to build a house in a subdivision in Idaho. It demanded that they cease construction and give the EPA access to it. Failure to comply with this administrative order would subject the Sackett family to a fine of $75,000 a day. Basically, what the Department of Justice was effectively defending was the right to put the Sacketts into a catch-22 situation. Either they complied with the EPA's rules or they faced fines of up to $75,000 a day while waiting for the Environmental Protection Agency to sue and basically denying the Sacketts their day in court. The Supreme Court rejected this nine to nothing. Then we have the case of U.S. v. Jones. The Justice Department essentially tried to convince the Supreme Court that the Fourth Amendment's protections against search and seizure should not prevent the government from tracking every American at any time without any reason. Believe it or not, Justice went into court and argued that the police should be able to attach a GPS device to your car without a search warrant or even any reason to believe that you had committed a crime. Or